Well, thank you very much for having us present at this meeting. Our talk deals with the book, The Self Does Not Die, by Titus Rivas, Annie Durbin, and Rudolf Schmidt. Suzanne and I, my wife here, uh, had the privilege of helping edit the English translation of the book, and we wrote the foreword to it. You can read more about our research at our website, selfconditionedmind.com. Yeah. So, a little bit about us. More than 40 years ago, Suzanne and I read Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, and somewhat later also Return from Tomorrow by George Ritchie. It was the story of his very deep, profound NDE detailing his encounter with the being of light whom he took to be the Christ, who took him on an extensive tour of the spiritual world. We felt that both books were very confirming of the spiritual nature of the human being and the existence of a transcendent spiritual realm. Many years later, in 2005, we began a serious study of NDEs phenomenologically. Neither of us has had an NDE. We considered NDEs to be the archetypal phenomenon of the relationship of the mind to the physical body. In 2008, we published our first paper on the theory titled The Phenomenology of the Self-Conscious Mind, which postulated that the mind is an independent, autonomous entity, the essence of the person, that separates from the physical body during an NDE and at death. A crucial part of the evidence of the separate autonomous mind entity are the accurate veridical perceptions of the physical realm during the out-of-body phase of the NDE. And this is where you feel that you're separated, yet you're still within the physical realm. You're hovering over the top of the ceiling and looking at everything and seeing everything. And you, what you see is accurate and can later be reported and checked. That's what we mean by veridical perceptions. As a result, we became familiar with many of the cases of veridical perceptions in the NDE literature and used them to argue that the mind is actually a separate entity from the physical body. So I'd like to start with some historical background for this book. It became clear, clear early on when Raymond Moody's book first came out that an essential question in the study of NDEs was, what do they really mean? And the ultimate question is, do NDEs actually mean the survival of physical death? And how do we know? The self does not die is playing a prominent role in the historical development of this question. And so, if historically, we can start with Janice Minor Holden, Jan Holden, and her work, which started around 1988 and is still going. Jan proposed that a key element of NDEs are what she called apparently non-physical veridical perceptions, or AVPs. These are perceptions of physical reality verified as accurate, verified by the NDE alone, verified by another person to the nde -er, or verified by an independent third party who has checked the witnesses and the facts. It's especially important that the perceptions could not have been perceived physically. AVPs can be investigated by testing them in prospective studies going forward in time and usually what's proposed is to use visual targets placed in hospital rooms. And Jan was a pioneer in identifying what a good visual target might be. And to date, 
There have been about six prospective studies, and to date, they have been totally unsuccessful to get an end year to notice, let alone identify, a target. ADPs can also be studied retrospectively by analyzing cases in the ND literature and investigating cases as they come. And Jan was also the pioneer in her classic analysis of 93 cases of AVPs reported in the literature in her 2009 paper. Almost always, the perceptions were 100% accurate. And 39 of the 93 cases were verified by a third party, which is, in our view, a, an important aspect. And most of those cases are included in The Self Does Not Die. Now, for NDE theorists, ADPs are an essential part of the NDE phenomenon. They are key evidence that NDEs are objectively real and imply the separation of the mind from the physical body. And part of the history is, during the past 25 years, there have been ongoing debates <coughs> and battles with skeptics, starting, we could say, in 1993, with a book by Susan Blackmore. Skeptics assert NDEs are easily understood by naturalistic, materialistic explanations that all reality derives exclusively from physical material processes. Therefore, all aspects of NDEs must have a material explanation. And the key skeptics have included Susan Blackmore, Gerald Worley, Keith Augustine, Kevin Nelson, and Sam Harris. Their main approach has been to explain away the NDEs with simplistic ad hoc physical mechanisms. And we'll discuss ad hoc hypotheses later. And there have been battleground vertical cases that are being argued over. But there's only a few of them. And you, if you're familiar with the literature, you have probably heard of them. Maria Shu, Pam Reynolds, The Man with the Dentures, and Eben Alexander, and there are a couple of others. If you are familiar, you will have heard of these cases, and if you have read about them, you will have heard the arguments. And I'll cover those cases in more de detail in the presentation. Rudolf Schmidt, Titus, Rivas, and many others, including ourselves, have worked actively to respond to the skeptics. And a little bit of history on the development of this book. The authors of this book, as I've mentioned, are Titus, Annie, and Rudolf, and they are all from the Netherlands. Unfortunately, Annie died in April 2016, only a few weeks before the com completion of the English edition. In 2011, all three of the authors hatched the idea to publish a book of the core veridical cases and that demonstrate paranormal phenomena, paranormal phenomena, or supernatural phenomena from NDEs. And the Dutch and Belgian IANS organizations helped collect cases, and Suzanne and I made several suggestions. The Dutch edition came out in 2013 with 78 cases, and the title was, in English, What a Dying Brain Can't Do, which was inspired by Hubert Dreyfus's 1978 book, What Computers Can't Do, which was a critique of artificial intelligence. The English edition came out, as I said, in 2016 at the 2016 IONS conference, and expanded with 26 additional cases to a total of 104, a 33% increase. Regarding IANS and the Maze's contribution, 
In 2013, with the publication of the Dutch edition, Suzanne and I encouraged the authors to publish an English translation. No regular publisher was found, so in February 2015, I proposed that IANS publish the English translation. This was accepted by the IANS board, which put up $4,500 in seed money, and the Dutch IANS organization put up another $1,300 to purchase the translation rights, and then over $17,500 dollars in donations came in from IANS members and friends. I coordinated the project with the translator, with Titus and Rudolf as the main authors, and with Jan Holden as the main editor, and several others, including Suzanne, served as editors. It was an intense labor of love. Most sections of the book went through 22 or 23 edits iterations. But it took just eight months to translate the Dutch book, add an English foreword, and 26 new cases, and print 100 copies for the IONS conference in July 2016. And the sales are now over 2,700 copies. More than 16 citations of the book have appeared in academic publications. And there have been other translations. Uh, the Italian translation was an independent publication in 2018, and the Spanish translation is still in the works. It's an, another IONS publication, and it will be ready for the 2019 IONS conference. Uh, Titus happens to speak Spanish, and we have two excellent Spanish translators. The IONS board has invested $3,000 for the publication, and we need to raise an additional $2,500 to cover the costs to produce this edition. So donations are welcome, and you can go to the ions.org and click on the red Donate Heart at the top. And we are planning a future English edition probably in three more years which will have at least another nine new cases and probably several more. And before we get into a more detailed discussion, I'd like to present some of the features of the book, particularly for those of you who have bought it or will want to buy it. Each chapter has an introduction and summary remarks, and, and each chapter deals with a particular type of NDE based on the kind of phenomenon that is of relevance, the paranormal phenomenon that's being discussed. And the narratives of each case include extensive documentation. So there are quotes from books and scholarly articles, there's email correspondence, and there is a list of the sources which you can look up, I mean, purchase the book, or if you have the book, look up the source, and the focus is on the verified paranormal aspects of the NDE, rather than all of the other details of the experience. So this does not go into, you know, 20 pages of each, each case. You could have up to 20 pages of some of the cases, but most of the cases are one or two or three pages, and it focuses on the paranormal aspects. There are 250 total source references listed after each case, so here, and at the back of the book in the references, and the references have back refer references or citations saying where it was cited in what cases and what chapters. Because some of the questions covered are very detailed, some specific arcane topics are presented in a separate section that's kind of boxed off called an intermezzo. And there are over a hundred internet links, as we see here, internet links, and including more than 20 YouTube links to relevant videos, YouTube and Vimeo videos. And the full reference list is available online, and you don't need to buy the book to check out the references and look at all the links. 
and that's at this URL. It's ians.org slash the self hyphen references, all lowercase. So you can check that out. And there's also a great glossary of terms used in the book. So in the rest of this talk, I'll be summarizing the different chapters of the book. I'll cover the main points of each section and summarize the important parts of one or two selected cases in each chapter. There's a lot more information for each case than I can present here. So these are really summaries of the key parts of NDE cases for specific paranormal phenomena. So to summarize the key points of our forward, there are a new number of research requirements in this, that this book addresses. The need to compile all the verified cases that are scattered across the NDE literature in hundreds of academic articles and books, and to add new cases as they come to light. The need to apply a standard of verification of cases and for a standard classification of cases. The value of uncovering hitherto unrecognized types of NDEs, and there is one that we feel was uncovered in doing this analysis. The value of enha to enhance scientific discourse by broadening the debate beyond a few favorite cases. We are tired of dealing with Pam Reynolds and arguing with the skeptics over the same details of her case or the dentures man or whatever. And the value of being able to view NDEs as a whole, as a complete phenomenon. And related to this last point, Explanations of NDEs, in our view, need to address all aspects of all NDEs, not just certain cases, not just certain NDE features. This avoids the error of generalizing from just a few cases or just a few basic aspects of NDEs. And from this perspective, the most parsimonious explanation is that all NDEs are what they appear to be to the nde -er. Namely, that the person's non-material mind or self, in fact, separates from the physical body. Furthermore, the objective reality of the nde -er separate spiritual self is demonstrated in this new type of NDEs, which we call apparitional NDEs, where the out-of-body nde -er appears to another person and that can be verified. The NDEs are not merely the subjective experiences of the NDE or him or herself. And this implies that the independent mind or self is real and also that it survives physical death. Finally, when we collect together large numbers of similar cases, we are on a stronger ground with the power of large numbers of cases, the validity of an explanatory hypothesis is exponentially stronger. And the weakness of some of the explanations of the skeptics is shown clearly because they are relying on ad hoc hypotheses. Skeptics will focus on a single critical aspect of a particular NDE and will find an explanation for it. For example, the NDE had subconsciously overheard a conversation about what she claimed she saw in her NDE. But that explanation can fit only that particular case, maybe a few others. But for other cases, other types of ad hoc explanations are needed and a scientific theory that must continually be shored up with additional ad hoc hypotheses is untenable. So 
So that was our forward, and this is a summary of the author's introduction. First, the authors describe the main criterion for including cases in the book. If a paranormal phenomenon occur during an NDE is directly confirmed by at least one other person. The focus of the book, as I mentioned, is on paranormal, the paranormal or supernatural aspects of NDEs. And this is from two perspectives. First, phenomenological research, which describes the NDE's subjective experience. And secondly, parapsychological or psychical research, which investigates the NDE's anomalies through empirically objective or intersubjective evidence. And this process must be done from a non-materialistic context or ontology because paranormal phenomena very clearly have a non-material aspect. And the authors describe two main kinds of evidence for NDE's re research. Evidence from experimental studies such as using visual targets in hospital rooms and the study of spontaneous cases. We have zero cases experimentally and we have thousands of cases that can be studied in, you know, from what was reported. Spontaneous cases. And so the authors are clearly proponents of the second view. Their approach is through case, case studies duly investigated. There can also be studies of patterns among many NDE cases. For example, NDEs that occur across different cultures. Finding patterns in large numbers of cases is good, but the patterns alone are not enough to establish clearly whether NDEs have paranormal aspects. So we said that we were not going to have questions, but I will take two questions <laughs> right now. So here's one. I, I've read a number of accounts, and one of the accounts said, uh, not one, a number of them have said that they've gone on the other side and actually met Jesus on the other side. Since this is a phenomenon that occurs in all kinds of races and creeds and all over the world, do other people claim to have met Muhammad or Confucius or Elvis or somebody like that? <laughs> okay, so let's take Jesus. There are non-Christians who, and you know, devout Muslims or Jews who claim that they met Jesus or atheists. And there are people of the other faiths who claim that they've met the Buddha or Muhammad or Krishna or one of the Hindu gods. So it has to do, I think, and this is our theory, is that ha that has to do with the apparent willingness of the spiritual world to present to you what is comfortable for you. So if you are expecting Jesus, the being that you see will manifest as Jesus or another being. And there are uh, several cases where the same person, for example, Melon Thomas Benedict, he was shown a number of different images and it kept changing. He's saying, why are you doing that? He says, well, we're not sure exactly what makes you comfortable. <laughs> so that's our explanation of that. Anybody else? Hi, um, I'm fascinated with people who have a life review and then feel something from the other person's perspective. Um, I've read many oh, yeah. of those stories. Yes. And I wonder if any of your research to verify has ever been to go talk to that other person that someone bullied and then, and then also the fact that a lot of people that I've heard come back and they, they've changed their, they either go from atheist to believing or be, they're kinder or all of those kinds of things. And if that comes into play with your research, verify. Yes, okay. The first part is that 
has anybody, any researcher, verified the content of a life review where you can go to the other person, the person that you have done something wrong to or maybe something kind to, and check out what in the life review they felt. And that has not been done, but that is something that we are calling on researchers to do. And we can go back to certain life reviews, unfortunately the people have passed away, these are a long time ago, and say, boy, it really would have been nice to talk to Tom Sawyer's aunt, whom he <laughs> really did in with a trick when he was eight years old, and verify with her, is this really what you were thinking, that he then reported you were thinking? And yes, we want to do that. And your other question? Uh, people who've changed their viewpoint and gone from maybe atheist to more spiritual oh, yeah. or kinder. Oh yes, people, people are transformed, yeah. particularly by what they see of what they've done in, in, their life, in, in their life review, or what they failed to do. And how do the skeptics reply to that? Okay, well, how, that's a good question. How would they... I have not heard a good explanation for that, other than they, they probably have a, a psychological explanation for that, that people want to be better, etc. The sheriff's best experience with a man who died and killed himself the part of <laughs> okay, so uh, Suzanne is bringing up the point about life reviews. One of the evidential parts that a life review has occurred is when there is the sharing of the person who is dying or is having a near-death experience, and they are seeing their life review. But if somebody else is drawn into that, and that happens with, particularly with shared death experiences, then the person who can, can actually perceive and verify that there was a life review, and if that person is close to the person who is dying, can verify, yes, those were events in that person's life. And, and I was in the life review too, because we did that together. And so we have not pursued that yet, but that's another line of uh, validation of the paranormal aspects of it. And that would be really good to do as well. Okay, so let's go on. So now we're going to look at each chapter of the book in some depth. We'll stop after chapter 9 for two more questions, okay? And then we will have mo many more questions at the very end. So, the first nine chapters of the book cover each of the groups or types of cases based on the main paranormal feature of the NDE. And there are a couple of NDEs that appear in more than one chapter. So chapters 1 to 3 here cover two-thirds of the total cases. These are cases of verified vertical perceptions, AVPs, depending on the NDE's condition and nature of the perception. And so we'll go into the details of those three different types. And then chapters 4 through 9 deal with other paranormal phenomena telepathic communication, after-death communications, which means meeting deceased relatives or deceased persons during the NDE, either persons unknown to the NDE -er and later identified, persons known to the NDE -er but not yet known to have died. And those are two cases that are uh, evidential. And then chapter 7 is these cases of what we call apparitional NDEs. The NDE -er appears to another person convey some information, and then both are able to confirm the interchange. As we said, we feel this is a new category of evidence that has received very little attention by researchers so far. Chapter 8 deals with miraculous healings following an NDE, and Chapter 9 is paranormal abilities following an NDE. And Chapter 10 is Titus Rivas's general observations in Chapter 11, is Rudolf Schmidt's account of the never-ending discussions with skeptics. So chapter one deals with extrasensory veridical perception of Im the immediate environment. And the authors start out saying, the cases in this chapter are those where we can't be certain 
of the exact moment of the purported veridical perception, or how well the end ear's brain was functioning at the time of the perception. So we can't relate the perception to the actual, what's happening with the person, the patient. And the cases with the highest evidential value are those which include statements from both the patient and one or more witnesses. And case 1.5, chapter 1, is Al Sullivan. This is an exceptional case because it was thoroughly investigated and a reenactment video was made documenting the medical procedure with the patient and the doctors in the video, including interviews with all of the key participants. So Al underwent an emergency bypass operation, heart bypass. <clears throat> his eyes were taped shut, as shown in the video, and his head was behind a surgical drape, and he was under anesthesia. During his NDE, Al was out of body and saw the cardiac surgeon, Dr. Takata, flapping his arms here. And Dr. Takata was doing this. And what he was really doing was he was giving instruction. He wanted to keep his hands sterile. He hadn't touched uh, anything yet. And he puts it on his sterile garment and was just flapping and saying, do this. And this was a personal habit that everyone on the staff was familiar with. Al mentioned the behavior afterwards to his cardiologist, Dr. Lasala, who was shocked that he knew of Dr. Takata's habit, considering that he was under anesthesia, etc. Al's description was confirmed and as accurate by both Takata and Lasala, and neither had an explanation for how Al could have seen this. And there are many more details of this case in the book. Now, the author's remarks at the end of the chapter are, these cases provide convincing evidence that during their NDE, patients are able to have correct, verified perceptions of events or conditions in their immediate environment that are not attributable to their physical senses. And given the specificity of the reports, chance, prior knowledge, and mental reconstruction are not acceptable hypotheses. And these are hypotheses that people were proposing, skeptics. Chapter 2 deals with AVPs. The cases in this chapter are cases of perception beyond the reach of the normal physical senses. So with Al, it was in the same room. These are way beyond the room. In these cases, we cannot be certain whether perceptions occurred during sensation of electrical brain activity. So that's another factor. Was the brain offline and they had the perception? That's even more evidential. So case 2.3 is Maria Shu, one of the battleground cases. Maria was a Mexican migrant in Seattle. She had a heart attack. She was brought into the hospital and while being monitored, had a cardiac arrest. During her NDE, she was out of body and she floated outside of the room, outside through the window, and up a floor and around to another side of the building. And there she saw a left blue tennis shoe on the window ledge with a worn area on the little toe and the shoelace tucked under the heel. Maria described the shoe to social worker Kim Clark, now Kim Clark Sharp, and begged her to find it. Kim went looking for it and found the shoe in the exact position and condition Maria had described. These details could not have been seen except from a position outside the window looking at the shoe. The major skeptical explanation that we have heard is that Maria overheard nurses talking about the shoe. Well, the difficulty with this is that she could not have overheard the nurses speaking about it in English 
in such detail because she spoke very little English. And another similar case is 2.15, 74-year-old Chester. He had repeated cardiac arrests over a three-day period. During this time, Chester reported he overheard a specific conversation between his wife and his daughter about an unusual tree that they were looking at, which was just outside the hospital family room. And he also overheard or heard his grandson playing with a toy tractor and knocking over blocks with it. Dr. Lauren Belge confirmed with the family that these events took place while Chester was in the ICU, far removed from the waiting room. And by the way, we highly recommend this book by Lauren Belge, Near Death in the ICU, for all its critical cases she describes, but also for her advice to physicians in responding to patients who may have had an NDE. In the remarks, uh, the authors note other types of similar cases. This can happen in remote self-induced OBEs that you see this. And also the authors describe research that Suzanne and I did in 2010 of George Ritchie's NDE OBE, which was really quite extraordinary. He died of double lobar pneumonia in hospital in south of Abilene. And then he found himself flying out over the Texas Plains and coming to stop beyond the river, sitting on the other side of a river at an all-night cafe. And that's 523 miles. And, and we found the cafe, the all-night cafe, going to Vicksburg, where he found out that it was, and we traced his path, and we also got the map of the hospital and figured out what war building it was in and which door he must have left out of because that was the door that he described going out of. And the latitude of the door and the latitude of the all-night cafe were exactly the same latitude, which means that he flew exactly due east. And he described looking, as he was flying, looking at his left and seeing the North Star. So he knew that he was flying east. And there's a link to our research site, selfconsciousmind.com slash Richie, all lowercase. So moving on to chapter three cases. Now these are the most important, the most numerous 36 cases. But also when you want to prove that the mind, the soul does not die when we have physical death, <laughs> You need a lot of cases. So this is ADPs, extrasensory vertical perception, during cardiac arrest or some similar conditions. So during a cardiac arrest, brain activity shuts down after 15 seconds. At that point, no complex conscious experience or memory formation is supposed to occur according to neurological theory. Yet under these circumstances, many NDEers report vivid experiences that are vividly recalled. So case 311 is my favorite, actually. It's not a battleground case yet. Um, it's recent. Uh, cardiac surgeon Lloyd Rudy was interviewed by a fellow named Mike Milligan, and gave a detailed account of an NDE in one of his patients during heart surgery. And this is a video that's on, it's in, in our list, and it's on YouTube. And there's a full transcript of the interview in the book. So, after heart valve replacement surgery, Dr. Rudy could not get the patient off the heart-lung machine and to restart his heart. So ultimately, the patient was declared dead, and the life-sustaining machines that were keeping him breathing and circulating his blood were turned off, except for the echo probe and other monitoring instruments. But by those instruments, there was no heartbeat, no blood pressure, no respiration for at least 20 minutes. 
Then the heart spontaneously started beating again and developing blood pressure. Dr. Rudy called the surgical team back and eventually resuscitated the patient. Later, the patient recounted several accurate vertical perceptions during this time. In particular, he saw the surgeon standing and talking in the OR doorway in their shirt sleeves. Obviously, they were not engaged at all. It was after the operation. And the doctor said that that's what they did. And there were post-it notes that were stuck together on a chain on a computer screen, telephone messages that the doctors had received. Very good evidence. Very clear what the state of the patient was. And I have to cover these uh, other, another two cases. These are battleground cases that have been the subject of endless debates with skeptics. Case 3.7 is the man with the dentures, and this was first reported by Pim van Lommel in a famous 2001 Lancet article. In 1978, a 44-year-old man named, well, just called Mr. V, was found outside in a park on a cold night. He was stone cold and blue. He, and he was brought into the hospital. He showed signs of postmortem lividity, meaning the blood pooling in the body, and the male nurse, initials TG, removed his upper denture, put the denture on a wooden shelf on a metal crash cart, and inserted an airway tube. There was still no heartbeat, and then he used mechanical heart massage, a thumper, and the pupils were unresponsive to light throughout the procedure, which means his brain was offline. And after more than an hour, Mr. B's heartbeat was restored and the man was moved to ICU. A week later, TG saw the patient for the first time since the resuscitation. The patient said, hey, you are the one who removed my denture. You know where it is. And he described how TG had taken it out and put it on a little pull-out shelf in the cart with all the bottles on it. Now remember, this took place before the thumper was used to try to restart his heart. And Mr. B reported many other vertical details, which are in the book. And then Pam Reynolds had a dangerous aneurysm at the base of her brain and underwent a complex hypothermic standstill surgery. The patient is hooked up to a bypass machine. The body temperature is lowered to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The heart and breathing stop. The blood is drained from the head. The aneurysm is snipped, and the body is gradually warmed up again. And finally, if needed, the heart is restarted with a cardiac shock. Sometimes it happens to start up spontaneously. And during the procedure, the patient's brain waves are monitored by EEG, and in particular using very loud clicks in small speakers taped in her ears. In the initial phase, Pam's eyes were taped shut. She was anesthetized, and a bone saw shaped like an electric toothbrush was used to open her skull. At this point, her NDE began. So she was out of body. She's just under anesthesia at this point. In the operating room, in particular, she sees the bone saw. She overheard a short conversation between two physicians, which was later confirmed as accurate. And by the way, her description of the bone saw was accurate. It's like a toothbrush. She experienced a typical NDE, going through a tunnel, meeting deceased relatives. On returning to her body, her body was being warmed up at this point, and she heard the song Hotel California being played in the OR, and it had been played. She observed two shocks to her heart. So she's outside her heart, she doesn't want to go back in. She sees the body jump, so that's the first shock. And then, while the second shock was being administered, she feels herself joining and falling back down. So she 
observed the two shocks, and medical records confirm that she had the two shocks. Now, this is endless. All of the details I just went through are endlessly discussed about the bone saw, etc. About Hotel California, etc. But the most evidential part is that the veridical perception of the two shocks when her circulation had not yet restarted. So she could not have described that. So in their remarks regarding cardiac arrest, now this is what they're talking about, cardiac arrest in general. When, the, when is brain electrical activity restored after it has ceased? Is there still residual weak heartbeat? Can electrical activity arise that could be responsible for NDEs produced by dying brains? And they conclude no. It makes no sense to continue to doubt the reality of the continuance of consciousness <coughs> during cardiac arrest, including vertical perceptions. And no electrical brain activity that might be happening three minutes after the person has supposedly died, that electrical activity is inadequate to explain the cases that were presented in this chapter. Okay, so those are the veridical perception cases. And the, the most evidential are when you can pinpoint that the heart was not working and, um, and yet there were veridical perceptions. That could have only happened and be observed at that point. Now, moving on to some other paranormal phenomena, we have telepathy. There are two types of telepathy in this context. The NDE perceives the thoughts of someone else and has contact with the other person's mind or consciousness. And the other kind is when the, another person is perceiving the NDE and has tele telepathic perceptions. And that's a shared near-death experience. So the most interesting one of this group, in our, my view, is this. 4.3. In 1976, George Rodanaya was a young Russian doctor who was seeking to, re to move to the U.S. on a visa. He was run over by a car driven by the KGB, declared dead, placed in cold storage in a hospital morgue for three days, from Friday evening to Monday at 11 a.m. when his autopsy began. During his NDE, he connected with his wife mentally he could see through her eyes and hear her thoughts as she was choosing his gravesite. She was also going over the possible men she could marry, weighing the pros and cons. What are you going to do? He's dead, okay? And you need a husband. He remembered all of her thoughts, and after he recovered, he recited them back to her verbatim. And she was so freaked out that she didn't want to have anything to do with him for a year. She felt she no longer had the privacy of her own mind, which when you're out of body, you can do that. When you're in body, you still have some of that ability. but. Then it fades, fortunately. So, and Rod and I had a number of other accurate veridical perceptions. And another very interesting case is 4.2. This is the unuttered sigh. Dr. Tom Outerheide was a brand new doctor, and he had never treated a patient with a cardiac arrest. Outerheide was on his own with the patient when the patient had a cardiac arrest. And he thought, how could you do this to me? And what he was referring to was, were the experienced doctors who had abandoned him alone with the patient. How could you do this to me? Using a de defibrillator, after I brought the man back, but he would just have another arrest. And after I would shock him again. So after I was alone like this from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m., the staff brought in lunch for the patient. After Hyde was hungry, and he couldn't leave the room, so he ate the patient's lunch. <laughs> Finally, after many hours, the doctors did stabilize the patient, 
And then about 30 days later, the patient addressed Alkahai. You know, I thought it was awfully funny. Here I was dying in front of you, and you were thinking, how could you do this to me? And then you ate my lunch. <laughs> the patient reported several other details that were accurate and outside his physical field of vision. Alkahai also reported that his thought was just a fleeting thought, just a fleeting thought that went through his head as the patient was initially arresting in front of him. And of course, the authors say that we would expect that you'd be able to read some of these thoughts with your telepathy when you're out of body, just like you can have clairvoyant perceptions of the physical world. Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 go together. So Chapter 5 is after-death communications with strangers. And these are NDE-related after-death communications. That is, meeting with deceased persons and communicating telepathically. In these cases, the NDE did not know the deceased person prior to the NDE. The deceased person was later found to have existed, and the NDE could confirm the characteristics of the deceased person. So, Viola Horton, case 5.5, she had an NDE out-of-body experience during cardiac arrest after gallbladder surgery. And in the hospital corridor, she saw her daughter with mismatched plaid outfit, which was a definite no-no in those days in the South. And she saw her brother-in-law in the hospital remark to a friend that he had planned to go out of town, but now he had to stay around because it looked like Horton was going to kick the bucket. <laughs> so Viola went through the tunnel in, into a beautiful meadow and met a deceased person appearing as a baby. And here's a case where, where the deceased being is appearing in a form that is relevant to the end of ear. So that's, you know, another example of that. He said that he was her brother. She did not have a brother. He told her to remember how he looked, the tiny cap, the dress, socks and booties, and to provide the description to her father. Now all of her perceptions were verified as accurate. Her father confirmed that his first child was a boy who had died a few days after birth and was never talked about in the family. And the authors say these cases are strong indicators of actual contact with those who have died. One skeptical explanation is that there is some sort of super psi that is involved, which is a hypothetical process that the end ear obtains the information subconsciously from using some form of clairvoyance. Well, in these cases, the end ear has no motive or desire or reason to access super psi information for the deceased unknown person. And furthermore, in these cases, the deceased person appears to seek contact with the living, the living person in order to convey information to them, which implies that the reality of experience in NDEs is an intersubjective reality, one that sh is shared with others. So the deceased person and the other body person are together and they are sharing the same subjective, intersubjective reality. And chapter six is, is related to this, but it is after death communication with familiar people who are not known to have died. And meeting familiar deceased people in an NDE is expected. You expect to see deceased grandma and deceased uncle because you know that they have died, but it is totally unexpected when the deceased is not known to have died. You know this person, but they're not dead. So a skeptical interpretation could be this is a projection of dreamy images from the NDE's unconscious mind. But if that's the case, how can you explain when the NDE knows the person but does not know that the person has died. The end ear is surprised to see the person there among other deceased relatives. 
So, case 6.4, nine-year-old Eddie Cuomo was hospitalized with a very high fever which finally broke after nearly 36 hours. As soon as he opened his eyes at 3 a.m., Eddie told his parents that he had been to heaven where he saw several deceased relatives. Then he added that he also saw his 19-year-old sister, Teresa, who told him he had to go back. But Teresa was alive at college. His father said he had spoken to her only two nights before. Later, when Eddie's parents telephoned the college, they learned that Teresa had been killed in an automobile accident just after midnight. College officials had been trying to reach the Cuomos to inform them of it. And these cases suggest actual contact with the other side. The NDA could not have known that the other person had just died. And then this is the category which we believe is a new discovery. So, observations, chapter 7, observations of out-of-body end-of-ears by others. In these cases, the end-of-ear appears to another person or otherwise makes their presence known, and some information is transferred, and both parties confirm each other's account. Now, in these cases, we say it's apparitional, but they are not ethereal beings. They appear as solid beings, beings who have... Um, you know, appear normal. So, case 7.3 is the best of these. It's the case of Olga Gerhardt, and was documented by Dr. Melvin Morris and Paul Perry. Olga underwent a heart transplant. So she has a new heart embedded. Her entire family was at the hospital except her son-in-law, who stayed at home. Initially, the transplant operation was a success. But at 2.15 a.m., all our family are still at the hospital. At 2.15 a.m., her new heart stopped beating, but she was finally resuscitated three hours later. The son-in-law woke at exactly 2.15 a.m. Olga was standing at his bedside. She seemed normal. He thought the operation had been postponed. He asked, How are you? She replied, I'll be all right. There's nothing for any of you to worry about. Give this message to my daughter, which was his wife. He wrote down the message, the time of day, thinking, okay, and he went back to sleep. When Olga regained consciousness later that day in the hospital, she asked her daughter, did you get the message? Olga had left her body and could not communicate with those in the hospital, so she went to her son-in-law, and Morrison Perry verified the details, including the note scribbled by the son-in-law. And Titus's comment is, such cases add to the growing number of cases that seem to defy materialist explanations. And chapter 8, Miraculous Healings. And these document paranormal healing of serious illness or injury during an NDE, or rapid healing at stage, in stages after the NDE. The healing is completely unexpected, some form of spontaneous remission that seems utterly implausible. And the NDE does not appear to sustain serious brain damage despite cardiac arrest or other assault on the brain. In case 2.4, Anita Morjani was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. She had refused chemotherapy. And after four years, her health started to deteriorate rapidly with widespread organ failure. She fell into a coma and had a deep NDE. She left her body had veridical perceptions of conversations her husband Danny had with doctors 40 feet from the room. And she also had a vision of her, her brother flying in an airplane to be with her. 
she was told that in this this is this is the the key point where you are reach a border she was told you could choose to return to your body and if you do you'll be healed of cancer but if she chose to stay she would die as the doctors had foretold and her husband Danny would also die shortly afterwards his life purpose was to help her she chose life and regained consciousness her tumors disappeared and her organs re recovered rapidly. Her case was considered miraculous and was reviewed by a U.S. oncologist who concluded that she should have died. And the remarks about these cases, all of the cases in this chapter are supported by statements from doctors or investigators who had access to the relevant medical records. And they also bring in this con um, this comparison with a, 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 something that probably most of you have not heard of, terminal lucidity. Terminal lucidity usually occurs in patients with dementia. And shortly before dying, these dementia patients suddenly regain all their mental capacities, memory, and speech. Whereas before, they were mute. They could not remember anything. They did not have mental capacities that were observable. And such cases should be impossible, given that their brains are irreversibly damaged. But just before they die, they regain all of their capacities. They sit up, they talk, they share stories, and then shortly after that, they die. And then, Chapter 9 is the last of the cases. Chapter 9 deals with paranormal abilities occurring after NDEs. So, and we all know this. After an NDE, people have paranormal abilities. They have psychic abilities and some really obvious psychic abilities. They include, for example, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, moving things, with your mind, after-death communications, seeing deceased people come to you, and precognitive dreams or visions. So there are two we want to do. Cheryl Lee Black has spoken at an IANS conference. She has had three NDEs at the ages of 2, 10, and 29. After her second NDE, starting at age 11, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK, or poltergeist activities began dependent on Shirley's emotional state. In one instance, her sixth grade teacher slapped her for not paying attention. And as the teacher walked away, a book from off the shelf at the side of the room flew and struck the teacher. And by the way, the teacher was really freaked out. And she realized what had happened. And also, she was in the grocery store the, with her husband, and they were in the vegetable aisle. And he's a funny guy. He, he told her a corny joke. And she, you know, reacted to it. That's stupid, whatever. Anyway, a bunch of lettuce flew off the shelf and hit him, <laughs> hit him in the head. So anyway, Suzanne and I worked with Cheryl Lee several times to understand and document her PK abilities, and several other investigators have done so at the Ryan Research Center, University of Virginia, University of Maryland. She has exhibited experimentally confirmed instances of psychokinesis, PK, moving a pinwheel or an eggly wheel in a sealed container. And she's had precognitive dreams and verified after-death communication with both known and unknown persons. Very psychically talented lady. And this one is really important to show. So case 9.4, Tom Sawyer. Tom had a profound NDE in 1978. His pickup truck fell on him, crushing his chest, and he was dead for 15 minutes. In October 1983, five years later, he had a vision of a crash of an L-1011 TriStar jet, passenger jet. At a gathering of NDEers at Ken Ring's home in Connecticut, a statement was made. 
there will never be another crash of an L-1011 plane. And because Tom could not let any untruth be uttered in his presence, he turned around and blurted out, that's not true. That meant that there would be another crash of an L-1011, and Tom became upset. So he says to Ken, why do I have to know this? I know so much about the details of the crash. Why can't I identify this white building that's very important to me? How can I know it's exactly 103 degrees, yet not know where it is? He said, Ken, I know all the people on this plane. He said, I can tell you their first names. He knew that 90% of them would die. He also knew all of the details of the man who would be killed on the ground driving a car. 22 months later, on the morning of August 2nd, 1985, Tom re retrieved his newspaper and had a vision of the next day's headline. He saw the headline, and that meant the crash would happen later that day. He called Bruce Grayson, he had been consulting with him about his vision, and told him about six or seven hours before it happened that the crash would happen that day. And because Bruce Grayson confirmed it, it's in the book. The plane was going to go down in a thunderstorm as a result of wind shear as it approached the airport. The crash would occur in the U.S. and the temperature that day would be 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Delta Airlines Flight 191 crashed at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport on October 2nd, 1985 at 6.05 p.m. The temperature was 130 degrees that day. 136 of the 163 passengers and crew were killed. One man on the ground was killed when his car was crushed by the plane when it slid across a highway. The plane ultimately crashed into two white water towers as it came to rest in a muddy field. There was nothing Tom Sawyer could do to prevent or mitigate this accident, and he tried. He flew to airports seeing if he could see the white building or something. So the remarks here, paranormal abilities are common in end of years, but they are rarely confirmed by independent investigation. Okay, said we were going to do some questions. Two questions before we finish up. Regarding your answer to this gentleman's question earlier, um, that these beings uh, appear to make somebody comfortable, and, and from everything I've read, that seems to be the case. And, and in the case of George Ritchie, it, he's, I think it's almost a direct quote that, that he said, stand up, you're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son, the Son of, God. of God. Yeah, so if they're just saying, if they're just trying to make the person comfortable by appearing as Jesus or Muhammad or whatever, doesn't that make them a liar? Doesn't that make that being, oh, the, oh. to say you're in the presence of Jesus Christ, if, if, if it's just... Yeah, yeah. If, it, if it isn't, yes, that would be interesting to say. So one should make that conclusion. You are recognizing it because you are told it. But there could be other cases. I don't know. Part of the problem with verifying paranormal aspects is that we can't go and, and take a deposition of, of the spiritual beings. Yeah, it's uh, just hard to believe God would do something like that. Right. Yeah. Correct. Good point. Thank you. Um, in the after effects, people come back with what you've described as paranormal gifts. Yeah. Psychic gifts. Yeah. Is, have you found in your research any connection between near-death psychic gifts and mediums, etc.? Is a connection, or are they totally separate? What have you found out of anything? Well, put it this way. NDE researchers have studied spontaneous mediumship experiences. 
So that is when their end ear you know, receives a message and is told this person needs to hear this. Now, mediums don't have to have had a near-death experience to have that kind of ability. And in fact, many of them apparently don't. You can't always tell whether a person's had an NDE because you know, they may have been a, you know, an infant and nobody told them about it. So I would say that those kinds of parallels are real. In other words, if you have these abilities of getting these messages and they are evidential, that is to say you can verify that what you're getting is true, and you have had an NDE, and that's, w that's what the studies of NDE, spontaneous mediumship experiences, post-NDE, are saying, then yes, it's the same phenomenon. Now, you can have other kinds of mediums, and you know we have not studied those. And I would expect some of them are real. We're not saying, well, because you have an NDE, you can now communicate with the deceased people. The deceased people are there, and there are after-death communications, and we'll talk about the confluence of evidence, that people who have not had NDEs have after-death communications, and so they are seeing their deceased person relative right there. And so all of these things, there is this confluence of evidence, and so we think that these things are related and mutually supportive evidence. And we have not uh, studied that in detail. Thank you. Okay. All right. Chapter 10. Titus lists, uh, so these are his general remarks. And Titus lists these criteria for inclusion of cases in the book. So there is no alternate explanation. There are reliable sources. And particularly if you can confirm the physical death that is during a cardiac arrest. Those cases are really good. If they can be confirmed, they would be in the book. And of course, the paranormal phenomena that can and do occur in NDEs, we've gone through them all. Clairvoyant perceptions, telepathy, actual contact with deceased persons, and also deceased pets paranormal manifestations of the end ear during the out-of-body phase, which is the apparitional um, NDEs, and the paranormal abilities that result from NDEs, ESP and PK abilities, healings, and poltergeist-like incidents. Finally, there are additional paranormal phenomena that are awaiting third-party confirmed cases, like share death experiences, and uh, cases that we can confirm of visual perception despite congenital blindness. And what can we say about the brain and the mind? The mainstream physicalist view is that consciousness depends upon the physical brain function. And yet, the end ears consciousness and paranormal experiences cannot be explained. And therefore, consciousness and mental abilities do not depend ultimately on brain function. The mind can function independent of the brain. And then one possible explanatory dynamic between the mind and the brain is the transmission or filter theory. And our theory is somewhat related to this as well that the brain acts to transmit or filter consciousness. And this view takes into account the dependence of ordinary consciousness on brain function. So ordinarily, in order to be con conscious, you have to have brain function. And the mind interacts with the, the brain. Confirmed cases of paranormal phenomena support the theory that the mind is separate from the brain, even though the mind and brain interact during physical life. Therefore, the mind survives the death of the brain, and end years have actual experiences of the hereafter. And skeptics then point out, well, the end years did not ultimately die, so their experiences do not imply what the afterlife is actually like. And Peter's response that there are two lines of evidence. The first line of evidence is that from chapter 3, 
from consciousness during cardiac arrest. So we talked about cardiac arrest, blood flow stops, EEG is flat, and yet there is complex consciousness. Subcortical brain activity also stops. Yet NDEs and cardiac arrest show complex consciousness while there is no measurable brain activity, contrary to the material's view, especially where no resuscitation occurred at the time of certain vertical and perceptions. And we've covered those cases. Therefore, consciousness is not the product of the brain that occurs in interaction with the brain. And clinical death and irreversible or actual death are functionally equivalent. All relevant brain function are shut down. Skeptical arguments that consciousness is totally dependent on the brain on brain function. So that is the normal view of neuroscientists that consciousness requires brain function. It is totally dependent on brain function. But you could also have the view that the, there is a mind and the brain, and when they are together, you need the brain or you'll have no consciousness. So when the brain is impaired, consciousness is also impaired. And then, of course, the fact that you have personal consciousness during cardiac arrest implies personal survival after irreversible death. And then there is the second line of evidence, which I'll go through very quickly. And that is personal survival from apparent contact with diseased persons, chapters 5 and 6. Communication with someone who has already died is evidence implicitly of personal survival. And then... The theory of personal survival is further supported by this convergence of evidence, recollection of previous lifetimes in young children, pre-birth memories, deathbed visions, and after-death communications. And so finally, skeptics deny that actual paranormal experiences occur, the NDEers are mistaken, and it's just a mere subjective experience with a di from a dying brain. And yet, this book presents uh, cases where it shows that the skeptics are wrong, and therefore there are far-reaching implications for humanity. In particular, the spiritual aspects of NDEs can be taken seriously. And then finally, we'll get this very briefly through Rudolf Schmidt. Rudolf's main point is that skeptics appear motivated by materialistic ideology to explain away NDEs so they can dismiss them out of hand. And there is a long involved controversy over Eben Alexander's book, Proof of Heaven, and we describe the veridical elements of his NDE that he met his deceased biological sister whom he didn't know, didn't recognize, knew she existed but didn't know what she looked like and there were time anchors. And there was tremendous controversy and criticism of which we wrote an article countering the infamous Esquire magazine article. And there have been subsequent studies that have been shoring up Evans' account, looking at his medical record. And then Rudolph talks about Dr. Worley, a militant atheist, He's an anesthesiologist, and he has an anti-religious sentiment. And he goes back and forth with Rudolf about the dentures man and also Pam Reynolds. And he hears encounters with deceased persons, and un known and unknown, and Evan Alexander's case. And then there's this phenomenon in dealing with skeptics about moving the goalposts and, and going too far in doing that. So... Well, maybe Pam Reynolds received a pre-op briefing and was shown the surgical instruments like the bone saw, and that's how she knew that it looked like a doctor toothbrush. So Titus writes to Pam Reynolds, and she says, I saw Dr. Spetzler in the afternoon. I was not given a tour, nor was I walked through the process. Oh, well, let's move the goalposts. Maybe she read about this in magazines and saw a TV program, and there they've gone too far. And finally, 
Basically, Gerald Worley tries to explain away MDEs because he is motivated also by a revulsion against religions. And he tries to explain away it by twisting the facts. And the question is raised, is no criticism allowed? Well, no, not at all. You can certainly assert that because MDEs don't follow mat materialistic principles, they can't be true. But then you can't deny what the facts are. To go wherever the evidence leads, irrespective of ideology, prejudices, beliefs, or objections to how things seem to be turning out. And then I summarize the, all of the points that I brought forward. If the self does not die, what are the conclusions on personal survival? And I, I will leave that here. Okay, so now we can have a few questions. Two-parter, quick ones. Has anyone in the NDE community taken a look at Edgar Mitchell's research and see if any of it is applicable? Edgar Mitchell's research. No, I never met Edgar Mitchell, but I talked with John Audet, who has worked with him. And we had a discussion about his view of, I should say John Audet's view, based on Edgar Mitchell's so I'm not sure if this is accurate, but my feeling was that it's still physicalist. That was my impression, anyway. So I, and I'm not sure that anybody else has been quoting Edgar Mitchell's ideas in their theories. It is mostly the quantum stuff, which we don't exactly agree with either. <laughs> so. So I think the answer is no. Okay, the other quickie is uh, there's other researchers that's been looking at uh, nanotubules in the Yeah, synapses. microtubules, yeah. Yeah. Have you done any research into those? The claim is that they're sensitive to some external radiation or, or they can right. detect things that don't come in through our senses. Right, this is Stuart Hameroff. And uh, a, a quick answer is we don't agree with that at all, actually. Mm. So, but it has to do with how the mind interacts with the brain, and and he's talking about some quantum physicalist explanation. Yeah. So our summary tonight is that self does not die. Correct. The difference between the intellect and the housing, which would be the brain. So my question for you is what is the economic situation on the other side of the veil? Do they use visa, checks, cash? <laughs> uh, what, I mean, uh, no one needs, everyone gets what they need. There was a statement uh, about the, something about the, the self is self-preservation. How do they, how does that run? Economically, what See, is the currency? The currency on the other side is love. Gotcha. And can we define the self as light, the component of light? The self that we're talking about is a spiritual being. We are all spiritual beings. Our essence is, is as a spiritual being. The essence or the way spiritual beings appear in the, in the spiritual world is as light beings. So, L and L, our summary is love and light. Yes? yes? That, that's a pretty good summary. Love and light, L and L. Okay, I, I'm just wondering about how body experiences where death does not occur, like during surgery, a lot of people can explain what happened in the operating room with everything, and is that included in your studies? Yes, I think your question is that people do not actually die, and they have an out-of-body experience with vertical perceptions or just a beautiful NDE, and they are, you know, you don't have to die. You don't even have to have an operation you can be meditating and have a spiritually transformative out-of-body experience and meet all of the requirements of an NDE because you have the same elements. 
Thank you. The research we're currently doing on world visions, most of the accounts that I've read or heard um, recounted have predicted things, but they do it often with the caveat that, well, we as humanity can possibly change these outcomes if we if we do things differently. And I see that in two ways. One, well, if it doesn't happen, then we don't need to worry about whether or not our vision was correct. <laughs> but it also is helpful in, as opposed to the inexorable nature of Tom Sawyer's thing where he wanted to change it, but it was just going to happen. I, I wondered if you wanted to give us a preview or if yes. you have thoughts on this. You know, this is our initial take on that. Many times, people who are getting these visions receive visions that are very precise, and they happen, and they have no way of affecting it. We feel that that's a kind of learning curve to say, hey, you are getting these visions, and they're real. So it's like, but you will get other visions that are just as real. In other words, your experience of the vision is going to be the same. It's going to be vivid. It's going to be like an NDE vision. And that's real too. We want you to pay attention to that one because we didn't want you to interfere here, but we wanted you to know what it was like. That's one. And the other is that these visions are given as a warning because we all have free will, and because we are exercising our free will, we can go off the rails. And we are going off the rails. That's what the warning is about. It's not a punishment for humanity, but it's a consequence, a natural consequence of our actions. We can change that. We can prevent the vision, or we can mitigate it. But uh, that's, that's our take on it. I mean, there's a million more other questions, or do we? One more. All right. She One more. Okay. Why, why do these people not release their medical records? I mean, Morjani, with the exception of one doctor who looked at them, uh, PMH Atwater, uh, especially Evan Alexander, they could just convince the whole world of life after death if they would release their medical records. Well, I won't be Evan Alexander did release his records and they were reviewed by Bruce Grayson and this was just published this year, I think, or last year. Yeah, so he did. And Bruce Grayson, Survi Kana, and I think her name is Linda Moore. Three MDs reviewed the records and it's written up in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disorders. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.